A lot of the appeal of Factorio for me comes from the many different ways it can be approached. You can concentrate on launching rockets as quickly as possible, or you can work on secure defences to hold back the ever increasing wave of biters. You can build your base around a gigantic maze of belt spaghetti, or some sort of gigantic train system, or maybe you prefer clouds upon clouds of bots. You can create a world with massive dense ore patches to allow you to concentrate on just building, or you can set up endless train networks to bring in resources from far across the planet. Then even on the smaller scale, your smelting system can be made in many, many different ways, depending on whether you want to use modules and beacons, or whether you want to use bots to unload your trains. There are so many different things you can do. The whole game is about solving problems in your own way. And this feeling of freedom and variety is only added to by the vibrant mod culture that has been so enthusiastically supported by the developers. From the little quality of life tweaks like long reach or squeak through, up to the massive mod packs that completely change the feel of the game, such as space exploration or angel bobs. According to Steam, I've played about 2,000 hours of Factorio in the last five years. I know that to a lot of people these are rookie numbers, but it's been long enough for me to get a good idea of how the game works and, and work through a number of mod packs as well. I did start off with the completely vanilla runs, you know, restarting a few times when I realised I'd made some kind of hideous abomination until finally I managed to launch my first rocket. I then messed around with rail worlds and various megabase attempts before starting on my first big YouTube series back in July 2019 with an Angel Bobs plus space extension run. Angel Bobs isn't strictly a mod, rather it's more of a collection of mods uh, written by mostly largely by two different authors, Arc 666 Angel and Bobbing About, and these work very nicely together. Completing this run through took me um, slightly more than a year, but I did eventually manage, manage to finish all of the uh, faster than light research and decided that was a good point to call the game done. My next mod pack was the ever popular Space Exploration by Arendelle. Arendelle is now infamous for uh, producing such good mods that he actually got hired by Wooby, the, uh, the Factorio developers. I started playing through this mod pretty much as soon as I finished Angel Bobs. I'm now about a year and a half in and I feel like I'm getting close to the end of it. Of all of the science packs, I've done most of them. Down here, we've got the, this, these belts are here feeding them all in, and there's only a little bit of space left up at the top here. <laughs> so yes, I think, I think I'm nearly there, but we'll see how, how, how long it takes me to get through the last, part, last bit of it. And I, I suspect it's going to take me a good few months to, to actually finish it. Finally, in parallel to space exploration, I played through Industrial Revolution 2, with some friends during the second half of 2021. This mod was written by Dclock and 989, who is known for his excellent artwork, and this really shines through in Industrial Revolution 2, but more on that later. So, now I've given you a, a quick history of my Factorio experience, I can start in on the main topic of the video and compare the three mod packs to each other, as well as to the vanilla late game experience, and talk a bit about what they give you and, and how they differ in feel. There is also, of course, the, um, the text version of this article available on the Alt F4 blog. If you want to go and see that, then uh, there'll be a link in the description for it. Each of the different ways of playing will have its own feel and its own challenges and standout features. In vanilla, the point of a megabase is to see how, how, how far you can expand and how quickly you can launch your rockets before your, uh, before your computer starts to struggle. You can see there my UPS has dropped down to 25 with this particular save, which is, I have to admit isn't one of mine, but I needed a vanilla, a vanilla playthrough to, 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 to show you. So you need, yes, you, you're waiting to see whether the, what's going to happen first. Are you going to have, start to have problems with your train throughput? Are you going to have, start to have problems with your, uh, with your computer processing power? Or just not, 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 even, or not being able to build the, the uh, various resources you need quickly enough? There's always a different challenge in there. The recipes are all fairly straightforward because you're using the basic vanilla ones. However, you're just trying to make it run faster and faster while keeping your vast networks of smelters and assembly machines all fed and all producing all of the things you need them to do. The mods, on the other hand, all make some significant changes. Angel Bob's does keep the same basic goal of launching a rocket, uh, but all of the recipes leading up to it are, are changed around significantly, making it far more complicated. And for example, in the early game, you start off by just crushing ore down, which I was doing over here somewhere, uh, like this, which produces a type of a type of crushed ore and some, and some crushed stone, and then you, you can which you can then be, then smelt into the actual resource you wanted, and then you discover that actually if you sort it first like this, then you can get two different types of ore out, which is quite useful, and then if you progress through more and more steps, as I started then eventually doing over here, you can then do various steps of washing the ore first. So I'm washing it here in um, 
in in water then again in acids and that produces lots and lots of different types of um, different types of processed versions of those ores which you can then turn from there into all the different metals you need Beyond that, you can you then have the options to process the metal. So here we've got iron ore being produced by this sorting facility, where actually I'm then turning into processed iron and iron pellets, iron ingots, um, and then finally into and then finally into oh, not actually even into iron probably into iron plates somewhere over here as well. Oh, but we melt it. No, sorry, we melt it first into molten iron and then cast it into into our actual iron plates. And also similar similarly for steel as well. So there's lots and lots of extra steps to go through for each one of these. And then we've got lots of extra metals as well. So we've got gold and we've got I don't even know what this is anymore. It's been so long since I've played it. But there's all these diff various different methods you go through to produce all kinds of different metals. Um, and so it makes the game far more complicated because there's far more different options to go through. Space exploration provides a continuation of the base game. So you start off building things in more or less the normal, more or less the normal way. So we've got my sort of standard um, assembly building mark ones, we've got belts over here, red science, ammunition, all this sort of green science, all the sort of stuff you'd expect from a vanilla Factorio run through trains and things. But then eventually you, you carry on with all, all of the normal all of the normal things up here. Eventually you launch your first rocket, and that is where everything changes. So up, yeah. So eventually you launch your first rocket, and that is when everything changes. From then on, you suddenly have access to an entire solar system. So you can start launching rockets off. You can go into orbit, you can go off to other planets, and you can go out starting to look for other other resources from out there. And you realise there's so many more different different types of science to do. Industrial Revolution also keeps the goal of launching the rocket, but it adds in a lot of early game content with different eras of systems. You begin with steam-based power systems, using it to power inserters and assembly machines and so on, as you can see along here. All of this is being fed by a supply of steam through these pipes. Um, and then for after that, you, you, then, you then get on to researching um, electrical electric assembly machines. And finally, there are laser-based ones that you, can, that you need for a few specialized recipes. It also adds in some extra processing steps for ores and some new recipes for circuits, but they're not quite to the same extent or the same level of complexity as Angel Bob's. The difficulty in a vanilla megabase is largely around designing on a scale you haven't worked at before. This could mean trying to work with longer trains, or designing a rail system that can cope with those trains, <clears throat> or planning out enormous arrays of machines that will produce everything you need in the, in the quantities you need them. Once you've launched your first rocket, however, there aren't really any new concepts to, to solve. It's all about making your existing solutions run faster, more efficiently, and on a much larger scale. There's also nothing in the game to stop you sprawling further and further out. The only limit to your expansion is how powerful your computer is, and whether it can keep up with all the simulation you're making it do. And this brings up the main challenge in megabase design, trying to make your designs efficient enough so you can squeeze in that extra rocket per minute in order to get that extra little bit of science running through your running through and, and allowing you to do your researches that little bit quicker. It's definitely a challenge, but not one that I've personally been quite so interested in. I'd rather be going out and, and solving new puzzles rather than trying to make my existing solutions more efficient. Space exploration very much takes the standard difficulty curve of, of Factorio and then like I said with the base game earlier, it just extends it. So you start off you start off with the standard red science, takes four steps to produce, followed by green science, which is a bit more complicated. Blue science tends to be a bit of a filter where a lot of players will get stuck. And I remember yellow science causing me a lot of a lot of struggles in my first few games, mostly because I was struggling to make the blue circuits fast enough. Space exploration continues this with the with your first um, space based science, which I'm now building over here. And this in and of itself isn't that difficult. However, it's made quite a bit trickier because you have to make it in space. So you need to work out logistics to get the components where they need to go. You need to learn how building in space works. You need to learn all the different comp different systems from up there. You need to learn to use rockets and so on. So in and of itself, these are mostly fairly simple recipes. Um, but you need, to, you need to think about everything in a completely different way. Once you've done that, you then get the four, four different choices, four different types of research you can work on. You can start on energy science, where you do things like building particle accelerators and lasers and um, and so on to, to, to bombard test pa test test stuff with with en with energy at high, at high rates and and you just you need a new metal for this, which is holmium, which you can go and ex get or get off on one of the other exotic planets. 
Then you've got astronomic data where you're using all kinds of telescopes and radio telescopes and then analysing it in these orrery things which are astrometric facilities and then more types of um, telescopes and, and, and so on. And all of this uses and again uses another type of new metal, this is beryllium. We've got the um, mechanical data to, uh, uh, over here where, where you, you bring in um, an iridium and then you smash it up in various different ways. So you've got some machines which will cook it, some machines will freeze it, others will shoot it or you drive trains into it or pressure test it and that sort of thing. And all of that produces different types of information as well. And finally you've got the biological where you make all kinds of different types of oozes and squeeze them through, through, through pipes and then do again do various types of testing on that. And again, once again, it requires another new product, it requires Vitamelange. So each of these requires you to go off to another planet, get the exotic material from that planet and then bring it back here and do various different things to it. A lot of this does sound like it's just flavour text and really all of the different researches boil down to put ingredient A and B in machine C to get output D and whilst that's true to an extent I'd say the various different sciences do feel distinct and they make you think in different ways. They all have different challenges whether it's dealing with throughput or dealing with fluids in lots of quantities and, and various byproducts, or whether it's dealing with um, enormous quantities of scrap that get produced. They all have their own feel. Being spread out across the entire solar system also gives you an additional challenges in logistics. Um, and you get to get, get round that in the, with the form of, uh, in the form of rockets and spaceships. So early on, and I say early on, I mean in sort of shortly after uh, launching your rocket you'll you'll then start to use cargo rockets to transport goods around you can build up massive spaceports like this where you have ranks and ranks of rockets all of which are taking off materials to the various different places they're needed and then after that you start to develop spaceships so for example i've got um this one here which loads up with various types of rocks and brings them back to back to facilities for processing and in this case i put trains on my spaceship because i wanted the extra speed of loading and unloading that the trains can offer other spaceships may, might simply ha might have um, massive, far more engines on the back because they need to go for longer distances and different ways of generating power because they're going outside the solar system. And you can use warehouses for storing all of the all of the resources you're bringing back with you. So there's lots of flexibility in here. The rockets are fun, uh, but give you a bit more of a log logistics challenge because you need to get the parts to build the rockets to where they're needed. The spaceships are a bit simpler; they're almost like, uh, to, to in, in a way, for logistically because they work a bit like trains. But you need to build a lot more resources to build them, and you need to program them yourselves with all of these um, combinators and, 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 and systems like that. So there's another challenge in there. Industrial Revolution introduces new systems to work with from the very start. However, in general, the designs you're building aren't too difficult. Later on, a lot of the difficulty and complexity feels like it's provided through having a larger number of intermediate steps and intermediate products. So for example, here we're building green circuits. This is a bad example because we've run out of all the parts for a lot of the stuff. But we're making... But we need to make copper sheets and copper cables and then make these uh, vacuum tubes and then circuit boards, solder and then eventually could make the green circuits. And then from there you also then end up needing to make um, these iron iron bars which to make into rivets, to make into these uh, small frames and then combine those with the circuits and some more of the um, of the vacuum tubes in order to make these green computer systems which are required for some of the more advanced systems you build. This is, as I was saying earlier, very true in Angel Bobs as well. However, I feel like it, it blended in a bit more cleanly in Angel Bobs. It felt like there's often a good reason to be making the in, in individual products. Whereas in Industrial Revolution, it sometimes starts to feel like a bit of a chore. Like you were just making them, f there, were, there were just a, a huge number of different parts required for just almost for the sake of it. The mod introduces a lot of different states a metal can be in. So you can have ingots, you can have plates, you can have rods, rivets, gears, pistons, and so on and so on. And all the different parts are required for various different machines. You then multiply this by the number of different metals that you need to work with. Um, so this is all very realistic, yes, but it made the logistics a bit harder if you wanted to have some sort of central system for producing resources. Or it means you end up doing a lot more assembly in situ. So when you, when you start building up your... Um, your villages for systems like here where we're making um, we're making blue belts and so that means we need to bring in iron which we're then making into these these iron um, I forget what these these are these are iron rods but also iron we've also got gear we also need to make it into plates to make it into gears and also into plates for plates themselves in fact this isn't iron this is high carbon this is carbon steel sorry but this the same principle applies there's the same sort of things for iron the same sort of things for brass, brass copper and so on 
and it all just makes things seem feel a little bit more a little bit more complicated and a little bit more difficult. I ended up shipping the ingots around by the, on the train system for pretty pretty much all of the all of the village systems because that was the um, the lowest common ancestor of all the parts because everything from from an ingot you can make absolutely everything. But it does mean you then have quite a lot of stages, especially if you need something like pistons um, on on the, in your or um, or the case or the the frames on 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 site. Industrial Revolution also includes the washing of ores that allows you to create a second type of metal from each, each ore. This puts you in an interesting byproducts puzzle where you need to balance both the main metal and the byproduct one. Eat, for example, turning the gold ore here into gold ingots and, and tellurium, where we're, we're making both the gold in, is obviously the yellow one, the tellurium and the purple down here. You need to make sure that you don't run out of either, but also that you don't end up with too much of either and have the entire system back up as the gold, I think, think might be starting to do a little bit here. Yes, there's a bit too much gold compared to the tellurium. So we haven't quite got the balance here, right? I did find this an interesting, quite an interesting step uh, and interesting to try and get the balance correct, even if we hadn't quite got it perfect by the end of the game, as you can see here. Angel Bob's has a well-deserved reputation for being one of the hardest mod packs out there, possibly second only to Pyanodons. And yeah, this is, this is, as I say, very, very well deserved. A lot of this complexity comes from recipes involving byproducts. So a lot of the mid-game ore refining methods, as I showed you earlier, will produce lots of different ores. So down here we had loads and loads of different ones being produced, and then I had this filtering system to pull them all out. But this all pales into comparison compared to the petrochem system. And so early, fairly early on in the game, you realise you're going to need a lot of plastic, as you always do in Factorio. And this means you have to delve into Angel Petrochem. So even just finding a chain of recipes in FNEI that will allow you to produce plastic in a sensible way is a challenge. So here we've got liquid plastic turns into a plastic bar. You get the liquid plastic from seven different recipes for producing liquid plastic. Then each one of those has various different processes required to make it, all of which will have then have various uh, side effects. So in this case, I decided the best way to do it would be to bring in natural gas, which I then was separating out into um, gas condensates and raw gas and sulfuric wastewater, which I was, I was then processing the raw gas into acid gas and natural gas liquids, and then on from there into um, what we've got here, uh, methane, ethane, and butane. And then from there, one of those gets turned into, I can't even remember where this happens up here, methane gets turned with steam into methanol gas and some residual gas. And then over here, we turn that methanol into propene, which we can then turn, turn here from propene into into the liquid, actual liquid plastic, and the liquid plastic into the plastic bars we need. And that's just one of the methods. And as you can see, there's so many different side products all coming off this. They're going into all the different tanks up here. And then you think, well, that means I'm taking in enormous quantities of this natural gas, but because it's going through so many different steps and we're pumping off so many side products, and in some cases just burning them off in a, with a flare stack like this, that you realise that that's an enormous waste of the input um, resource, and you need to, you, you can you'd be a lot better off if you started doing something with all those resources. So then you end up up here with a system that's turning um, the methane gas and some naphtha into here we go. No, so it's the other way around. It's turning carbon monoxide and thermal water and gas condensate. So we're using up the gas condensate I was making earlier. And we're able to make some methane, which goes back into the system, and some naphtha, which can also be turned into plastics. But for that, you need to somehow get the carbon monoxide. So over here, we've got um, somewhere, we've, we've got a, a system where we're burning um, coal to turn it into, um, into to, to make the carbon monoxide. And then over here, we've got a system that's taking the methane and turning it into the, to, to methanol again. That's the same one. But the there's so many different things, and you, and you tangle all these together. Over here, we, we're turning, we're making solid fuel out of something. Where, yeah, there's there's an enormous quantity of different things, and all of this stuff is basically going into trying to make the plastic production a little bit more efficient, and then also trying to produce a few other little things as byproducts of it as well, like sulfur production. We we seem to be making getting through enormous quantities of that as well. So it, it just adds up and adds up and adds up, and it gets more and more complicated. You're trying to get your head around more and more different different byproducts and different different processes and that and even then you still may not may find you're not actually producing as much plastic as you want the way i've often looked at this game is that the angels mods add extra complexity so this is the angels petrochem we've got the angels ore processing going on over here that i talked about earlier in the in, in, in the video and then the bobs mods are there to make things to give you better machines in order to deal with it which um and this isn't entirely true. I mean, the Bob's enemies definitely add some um, ex extra frustrations and makes things harder. I'll show you a bit more of them in a bit. But it's a sort of a nice first approximation. 
And so we get over here, we get a, a lo loads of different tiers of belts. So you start off with the basic belts. I think these ones are even actually even worse than the standard Factorio belts. Then you get the yellow belts, of the familiar ones, red and blue again. And then beyond that, you get even faster ones with the purples and the greens. And each level, in order to make it a bit harder to produce, you have to deal with a different type of material. So the basic ones, you chuck in some iron and some wood, some, you make some iron gears, and that's enough to make the basic belts. Then for the next tier up, you need tin, I think this green metal is. Then you need bronze for the red ones. And then you need, I don't, is this titanium? I'm not sure. And goodness, and then, and so on. And I was going to say naquium, but then that's, that's a space exploration. Maybe it's vibranium. I don't, I don't know. You require more and more exotic metals, and then you have to make the, um, and you have to make gears and um, bearings for some of the later ones, and then eventually you start having to feed in lubricants as well uh, as part of the bearings, and it just gets, it gets harder and harder with it for each different level. But it's so totally worth it because these green belts are amazingly fast, and you get the same sort of things with the, um, with, with the personal, personal upgrades as well. So if I have a look in my armor, I've got. Power Armor Mark 5, which gives this enormous grid. I've got Personal Laser Defenses Mark 6 that do huge amounts of damage. I've got loads of these exoskeletons. And that means that my character moves around incredibly quickly. And you've got the same thing all over the place as well. So you, we've got um, the, sh the shields do the same thing. We can make faster and faster trains. So my trains really zip around the base. Um, and, but, but in order to make that, you need to start making these more and more advanced types of um, circuits. So we've got yellow circuits down here. These are the most basic ones followed by red circuits up here which required all of this stuff in order to make them and then the blue circuits again lots more complications and I think there was a purple set of purple circuits as well or was there another one I can't um, yes here we go purple circuits up here so it gets more and more difficult the further, the further up the system you go but also you get better and better radars so these so these radars these are um, mark 5 radars if I get get one of these out then if you look on the on the mini map over there you can see that the I can't even show you the coverage of one of these radars because it's so big it's covering more than my entire mini-map. Um, but put it this way, there's one, that's Roboport, but the same, same thing, again, same thing happens with Roboports. If Roboport has an area, has a coverage area of, well, there's one in one in the middle of here and it's covering this entire area. There's a radar, there must be radars out here somewhere. But again, they, there's so few of them because they cover such a big area that I can't even find one. Um, so you get the massively powerful buildings and things, but you really, really have to work to earn them. And that goes across the across the um, across everything. You've got you've got better uh, assembly machines, you've got better inserters. And one of the best things about these inserters is, is look at this one. You, you can set where you want the inserter to pick up from and where you want it to put down across this enormous. 7x7 seven seven grid. It, it gives you so much more flexibility and you can even choose which side of the um, of a belt they drop the, they drop the goods on as well. So you've got much, loads of extra flexibility to help you deal with all of the extra complexity that's added in by the mod. One of the other quite nice things about, about the game is if we look at look at the um, the belts coming across here, each of the belts is also also includes the previous tier of belts, and the same is true with the inserters and the assembly machines and everything else. And that means when you go out and do a massive upgrade across your factory, you don't need to, you um, you don't need you don't end up with chests full of random rubbish because all of that stuff then gets passed on and put into the next generation of whatever you're making. So all of the all of, when I go out and do an upgrade, all the yellow belts get turned into red belts, or the red belts get turned into blue belts, and so on. So you get that nice sort of Nice system flowing through and you don't end up with lots of rubbish you don't know what to do with. I finished off my Angel Bob's run by playing through the Space Extension mod pack. And this essentially puts in a load of extra researches you have to do at the end of the game in, in, order, to, in order to count it as actually finished. Now, this isn't... None of this actually gives you any extra toys to play with. It's simply there as a sort of a massive research sink to make sure that your factory is running quickly, efficiently and effectively. And... So it doesn't really add any extra difficulty as such, but it does force you to make sure that you've got your factory running well and go through and tweak and improve things rather than just doing the absolute bare minimum to get the rocket launched. And as you can see, some of these research end researches, they require 2 million of each of the packs, and that means you have to launch absolutely enormous numbers of rockets, which is why I've got this field of rocket, rocket launch pads over here. And yeah, I'd have gone in and put more in, but the amount of resources or amount of infrastructure required just to produce the fuel for these rocket launchers is it's all this stuff so again you've got the angels side of it here that says well in order to if you want to, yes you can launch rockets that quickly if you want to but there's quite a few steps to go through in order to make the rocket fuel i hope you're ready for this and some of these will have byproducts as well so 
this this one's particularly uh, nefarious because we've got um, you require sodium hydroxide for one of the steps in here, this particular step for electrolyzing goodness knows what to make chlorine, but I think um, or yeah or possibly hydrogen. So you've got you need machines to make the hydrogen the so sodium chloride so hydrogen what hydrogen whatever these things are I can't remember um, to make those, but sometimes you've got too much so i had a train here available to take them away but then you realize actually no the, the balance is the other way so i had i need then to start training them in so it keeping everything balanced with all the byproducts and all the different resources you required was really quite difficult it's quite hard to summarize all of the uh, all of the changes that have been made down to a direct comparison I think that overall Industrial Revolution was probably the easiest of the three mod packs. It's certainly the one I finished the most quickly, although I did have some extra people helping me, but even taking that into account I think it was probably the easiest one to finish. Space exploration starts out at vanilla levels of difficulty. Most of the initial playthrough, as I said, is um, is pretty much vanilla, but then it just keeps ramping up and up over time, so slowly raising the temperature until the, the frog is well and truly boiled, but it rarely causes you to feel overwhelmed during that process. Angel Bob's is much harder pretty much from the beginning and there were certainly a number of times when I had to step away and try and collect my thoughts, particularly with the, um, the, the, the petrochem and some of the metal, trying to keep the metals balanced over here. All three of the mod packs introduce lots and lots of new buildings and new processes and as such need new graphics to go with them. I feel that Angel Bob's is probably the weakest of the three. The buildings certainly aren't ugly. They're not. They're not bad. It's generally clear what they're trying to do. These are all sort of. These are all obviously um, chemical plants of or various types of advanced chemical plants that do things along those lines. But I feel they don't quite fit in with the general Factorio aesthetic. They they look a little bit sort of pasted on. They they don't look as dirty and diesel punky as, as a lot of the rest of the uh, as, as the rest of the buildings do. I think it's probably down to sort of the level of detail or the lighting on them. It's, it's slightly hard to put my finger on exactly what I, what it is that that that, caused, that makes me feel this way, but I feel it's. I'm, I'm, I didn't have any problem with the with the graphics as I was going through, but they don't feel quite factorio. I guess is the best way to put it. Another thing is that a lot oftentimes the a lot of the different up different versions of a machine are distinguished by uh, just simply through a palette swap. So down here we've got some assembly machine fours, they look like every other assembly machine except these ones are blue. We've got the um, blast furnace three that looks exactly the same as every other blast furnace in fact and except maybe I think they were all orange I don't remember I don't remember any other specific details of them. Yeah as far as I can tell they all basically look exactly the same so they've there's there are might maybe minor changes between the different versions of machines, but they, they, there's a lot of similarity between them. So there's not quite that level of effort gone into it, but they still, but I, th I feel they still look pretty good. Also, some of the icons are of various different resolutions. So if you see here, these bronze or possibly brass plates here, they've gone a bit sort of fuzzy and pixely as I zoom in. Whereas over here, these blue circuits have an astonishing level of detail when you consider how far away you normally see them from. So. I suspect this is either down to where the artwork came from or exactly when it was added in, but often I feel that there's not quite that level of consistency in there. Space exploration uses a lot of very large machines. If you've got used to the um, the standard 3x3 assembly machines, or perhaps it, it, at an absolute push, the 5x5 uh, oil refineries, then some of these things will come as a bit of a surprise, like this material fabricator is 11 it is 11 by 11 uh, these these laser facilities are not quite as big but that looks like a 7 by 7 and you've got these extra large assembly machines you've got particle colliders and so on so there's lots of lots of big machine lots of large machines to get used to and, and play around with and I feel that all of these are excellently rendered they feel it fits in very well with the general aesthetic in that it's a sort of higher tech version but still having that sort of diesel punk feel of Factorio with the plates riveted on the sides and arms going in, into this void in the middle and that sort of thing they're all very nicely animated, like these uh, plasma generators have this sort of wibbly plasma effect going on inside them. Um, this mechanical facility is clearly doing some sort of crushing in, inside it. We've got another one that looks a bit like, that looks a lot like the uh, previous electromagnetic facility. These ones have got buzzing cables going, so there's, there's all kinds of different levels going on here. The consistent feel and style and, and the resolution really helps everything come together nicely. Um, 
that said, there is definitely some noticeable artwork reuse, especially with some of the higher tier later on endgame buildings. So down here, you'll, you'll notice this particle accelerator, the material fabricator and the particle collider. Uh, they're all absolutely identical machines, with, just with pallet swaps between them. This doesn't matter as such, I and mean, they're easy to tell apart, it's never been confusing to, for, for me, but it is a slight downside. As I say, I've never really struggled to tell the buildings or the resources apart. The only time I've ever struggled at all is just because of the sheer number of different things. But even then, if you, if you, if you remember to zoom in a little bit, you can always tell things apart. I think Industrial Revolution is the winner in the graphical area. It doesn't beat space exploration by much, but the visual interest provided by the three different tiers of technology um, the burner, uh, well, burner or steam, electrical and laser it really comes across in the artwork. Whilst, as I was complaining about earlier, that the different tiers are, uh, with a different mod, the different tiers are distinguished by colour, there is a lot more to it than that. The assembly machines move from sort of having big, slow drills and cutting wheels and things on the on the steam versions to having circular saws and 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 um, arc welding and so on in, in the middle tier, and then moving on to lasers for the for the um, for the top tier. So they're, they're all quite different. The furnaces are all in completely different shapes as well. In short. The machines all feel different and distinct, and you can tell at a glance what anything is and what it's supposed to be doing, and that it's different from the machines nearby. And I think that's a really good thing about the a good thing for the mod, and it makes things look much more visually interesting and visually appealing. In short, it feels like a lot of care and attention has gone into the artwork in this mod, and the mod looks very good because of it. Combat has never been the main focus of Factorio. Past a certain point, the biters are largely there to just stop expansion being trivial and to provide an extra load on your factory, which you can treat either as a logistics or as an efficiency puzzle. In a vanilla megabase, most players will turn off biters to save UPS, and even if they're kept turned on, all you really need is a well-supplied wall of turrets to keep them out, and a combination of artillery, nukes and, and personal lasers to push them back. Space exploration doesn't do a huge amount with combat. There are no new types of biters or spitters to worry about, and the standard wall with um, bullet and flame turrets has always done well for me. You do get some new interesting personal weapons though. For example, um, these include a lightning gun, uh, which can attack multiple multiple enemies at once. You get a bio, bio gun, which I think is supposed to sort of pass a sort of small disease around a cl clump of biters, killing them all very, very quickly. And there's a rail gun, which does a huge amount of damage at long range, but a single shot at a time. There are also some industrial scale weapons, including an interplanetary railgun and a plague rocket that I have to admit I've not used yet. Um, but there's also the solar powered energy beam, which you can use to burn your way across the planet, just killing any biters in the area. And this is wonderfully effective and very satisfying to use. Despite all these new toys though, I haven't really done a huge amount with them. The vanilla style wall is keeping my base on the home planet of Norvis completely safe and you can generally find peaceful planets to gather the resources on. I think there is potential in the more advanced weapons, but the game hasn't really pushed me into having to use them very much. You do need to worry about defending against meteor strikes and the occasional coronal mass ejection, and much like the biters, this gets easier as you advance through the game. Industrial Revolution also keeps the vanilla enemies, but it replaces the turrets. So we have a scattergun turret here, which is basically a big shotgun on a turret base, as well as a, um, an autogun turret, which is more or less the standard Gatling gun. It also provides new types of ammunition, both um, bullet and shotgun shells, and various tiers of those. And unlike the other mods I've been talking about, you, don't, you tend to find that the previous tier isn't required to make the next tier, which in a way is interesting because it then has the you have to go in and rebuild things in a completely different way and it gives you that extra interest and and also stuff to to use up and and you can then scrap old machines and turn them into new machine turn, turn them back into the metals to use for the new for new machines i found having the two different types of turrets plus actually plus plus the uh, flame turrets as they're same as vanilla ones the two different types of turrets were quite interesting because it, it encouraged you to use a variety of them in your defenses here the um the, auto, the uh, scattergun turrets are great when the biters get up close because they're absolutely devastating with the, um, with the but they're only very very short range and that means that the spitters can often outrange them so at that point you then need to have the autogun turrets to uh, to keep the spitters away and to and to and to plink out and, and, to, and to wear through the uh, the toughness of the stronger enemies so between them they make an, they make an excellent they work very very well together but you definitely need to have both types of turrets in there I did find that we struggled quite a lot with combat in the mid game 
I'm not sure whether this was due to us releasing more pollution than I'm used to due to having a larger number of players. Although again, Industrial Revolution helps helps you a bit with that, with the um, the arboretums or the forestries over here, which grow trees and to make wood for you. And as you can see from the pollution here, they're sucking up the pollution quite effectively as well. And you also have um, these air, air purification towers that you that pull in graphite and then will clean the air around them. Again, helping to reduce the amount of pollution that's escaping your base. And so I think we might have been producing pollution a bit faster than I'm used to because there were more of us playing. Um, however, we did definitely find we struggled. It's a good thing we had multiple players, as it allowed us to support each other. So you could have one person kiting the biters around while another person put down some turrets to shoot them. Or you could have one player working on defences while another player made sure the am ammunition supply could keep up. Angel Bobs, or more specifically Bobs, made the biggest changes to combat after the three. There were we have new tiers of biters with um, various extra big ones beyond the normal normal three or four that you get in in vanilla. So we've got this uh, we've got the bear moths, but then we also go up to leviathans, and I think there's, there's some titans around as well, and, and so on. However, there, there, we've also got the different colours in here, and these represent different types of um, of of, um, of, of biters and spitters and they have different types they have various different attacks so some of them will will launch fireballs some of them will do a sort of electrical attack some of them will do poison attacks and so on so there's a certain amount of variety in there so that said whilst the bigger biters do have a lot more health the different attacks don't really make a huge amount of difference they all just cause damage in one way or another in order to help with these stronger enemies you get various new turrets in in the game so we've got the standard gun turret but we also have these sniper turrets for example and these um, these are unlocked quite early on in the game, but they have a much slower rate of fire, but each shot does a, a huge amount more damage and is quite capable of one shotting a lot of the enemies that come running in at about the point when you get that when you get that turret. So it becomes a much more efficient way of using ammunition and a brilliant way of just picking enemies off very, very quickly. It's not so good against hordes of very, very weak enemies, so I tended to pair them with the uh, normal Gatling gun turrets, but it's very nice on its own. I did find I struggled a lot with combat in the mid-game as well, but that was only really until I discovered these plasma turrets. And the plasma turrets are absolutely amazing. They're, um, they have a, do a huge amount of damage, as I'll demonstrate now. So they're capable of taking out even some of the biggest biters with only a couple of shots. The danger of them, though, is they do enormous amounts of uh, splash damage, and so they're quite capable of doing crazy, crazy amounts of, enemy, of uh, friendly fire. So you need to be very careful with them. I did lose a lot of stuff through friendly fire while I was, while I was playing this. <laughs> the other notable difference is that with this, um, with these mods, when you kill biters, they drop these little um, artifacts. And when you when you destroy biter bases, the net, when you draw the net, destroy the nests, they produce these larger artifacts. And these are used in some of the more advanced researches, particularly for the later later modules you can unlock. Uh, and it gives you an extra resource and a reason to sort of push out and try and kill kill the biters. Um, but you do get to the point where they're actually not too difficult to collect. And you need you, when you're doing the research, you need, tend to need the various different colours of them in, very, in different amounts. But there are rebalancing recipes to go through and just sort of sort that out. So it's not too much of it. It's not too difficult. The three mods do all feel very different due to their approaches. I feel like space exploration works very well as an expansion, as it has an excellent smooth difficulty curve. Angel Bobs is a, good, is a good choice if you want a more complicated processes and something that ramps up the difficulty right from the start, rather than being gentle early on. Industrial Revolution is definitely more difficult to progress through than vanilla, but it feels like it's more about repeating the same steps more times. Finally, of course, a vanilla megabase is a, is a challenge in throughput and logistics. Exploring a new mod pack can be a great adventure. Space exploration pulls this off on the grandest scale, with new planets to explore, all with their own terrain types thanks to the Alien Biomes mod, new resources to find, plus the additional challenges of building in space. I'd put Angel Bobs in second place here, as there's always interest in a longer or faster inserter, or ludicrously fast exoskeletons, or, or the nuclear construction bots. There's also new ways to process the ores you've been working with so far, and the daunting task of making a new type of circuit. It's a different type of exploration, but it's still great fun. Industrial Revolution also includes new ways to process resources and new toys to play with, but it, it didn't have quite the same excitement for me personally. Replayability is an extremely important part of Factorio, with a lot of people putting in literally thousands of hours into the game. 
Playing vanilla allows you to keep coming up with more efficient systems for producing the science packs, whether that's untangling your rail network, designing layouts with more beacons, or building a faster smelting array, and those urges to improve are what keeps us coming back. When I finished Angel Bobs, I had a number of ideas for things I would do differently if I was tempted to play again to try them out, but decided fairly quickly that I'd rather move on to a different mod. With Industrial Revolution, once I'd finished it, whilst I'm sure I could have made a more efficient factory if I'd played again, I didn't really have the urge to. I'd enjoyed the game, but I didn't really want to play through it again. Space exploration has a lot more flexibility, so there are already things I know I want to try on my next run, perhaps largely skipping the rocket stage of the game, or, or doing my, all of my ore processing in one massive centralised system. I already have plans to do a run combining space exploration with Crestorio 2 with my friends once we've finished our current Minecraft run. So to keep an eye on how my future runs get go or how I'm getting on with space exploration, please make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel and follow me on Twitch. I'm currently streaming space exploration on Wednesday evenings and releasing the summary videos of those streams every Sunday. The channel also has our Minecraft to Dungeons, Dragons and Space Shuttles playthrough, which streams on Monday and videos on Saturday, and the GTA Manhunt runs on Thursdays. I also plan to take a look at Dyson Sphere program at some point in the future. Thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed my impressions on these mods. If you have any questions about it, come along to one of the streams and ask, ask me there or drop a comment on one of the videos. I look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks for watching.